this is about a major court ruling that came out of the Americans with Disabilities Act. My job today is to give you an overview, hopefully in ordinary person language, in a way that spurs you to ask questions and um, then to, if need be, point you to the direction where you can get more information. The Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990, broadly called the ADA, it is a federal civil rights issue. It's not a social service issue. It's a civil rights issue. And I think that that is important for people who have historically sort of had their lives directed by other people merely because you might need some supports to achieve some of your personal goals does not mean that you, don't, that you are not a full equal citizen or immigrant or human being. You are full and equal to any other human being regardless of your abilities or the need for support for your disabilities. So I want to emphasize this. This is not solely about reconfiguring services. It's about empowering people to understand why can't I live in that apartment? You know, now in some cases there will be barriers. We all know that. But can those barriers be accommodated? If you have a dream, a hope, you should feel for free to say it. This is about dreaming about breaking barriers and achieving your rightful place, rightful place, not necessarily the place society has put you in, but your rightful place. The Olmstead case, in a nutshell, was two women confined to a psychiatric institution, but they also had some uh, developmental disabilities. And when it came time for them to leave, they said, well, you need a setting that has more supports. We have none of those settings that you can go to. And this was in the state of Georgia. And um, Olmstead was the commissioner of Georgia at that time. Um, and the, uh, so they stayed there for years. No one developed anything to meet their needs. They just said, we don't have it, so you're not going to get it. And they sued. And eventually, after years of fighting, the uh, Supreme Court decision in Olmstead versus LC was settled saying, you cannot confine someone to an institution, highly segregated setting, merely because the state has failed to develop opportunities. Integration means the opportunities to interact with non-disabled persons, not just in a less restrictive setting. I cannot emphasize enough the gap between the jargon we have used in the state of Minnesota, a person has a right to leave in, live in the least restrictive alternative that's available to meet their needs. And this says, no, they have a right to live in the most integrated setting that can be achieved with the support and services that they need. The court has a two-part test. One, the treating professionals have to determine that community placement is appropriate for the person. The person does not oppose the transfer. People who have lived for long periods of um, time under the care, custody, and control of others have never developed the skills, have never even known they had a right. It is about also supporting people to make decisions. This is about changing thinking to say not why someone can't do something, but to think, well, how could that person do that? People aren't intending to be bad. They aren't intending to be mean. They want to protect you. I want to emphasize this isn't just about getting people out of institutions. Because we have some people that get by in the community now, but they can't fully integrate. It's also about reasonable ability to get 
access to the support services you need. It's not all about living in the metro area. And it's about the individual choosing. You know, states also have an obligation to prevent institutionalization. Protections also apply to persons already living in the community when a state's action may result in an institution. So it is about challenging assumptions. Um, that's a place where the rules and regulations were inherently ridiculous. There wasn't enough flexibility. Um, another defense the state can raise is the existence of a comprehensive affecting working plan. We have a sub-cabinet, what are they developing? A comprehensive, effectively working plan for placing individuals or allowing individuals. I don't even like the word placing because it, to me it's about individual choice. But having people live in the most integrated setting that they can. That person-centered is to saying, what do you want to do? What do you, where do you want to live? Meaning it's centered around the person's goals, wishes, and desires. It is a balance between the resources available and your desires and, and wishes. When we are moving to a system where every client who comes that, through that door is a unique combination permutation of needs, that requires some balancing. A comprehensive, effectively working plan for qualified individuals, that says less restrictive. I tried to eliminate those because it should be for most inclusive or most integrated. Um, it has to, if it has a waiting list, it has to move at a reasonable place, not controlled by state endeavors to keep institutions full or populated. I don't think Minnesota has a goal to keep its institutions full. ADA can require a state to make reasonable modifications to its programs and services to provide integrated community-based services rather than relying on institutional placements, including segregated placements in the community. And I would challenge all of you to think broadly. Um, I see people go into the institution because you know, it's not just about getting out. It's because what they need isn't available in the community. So the difficulty for the system people is to say, how do we have the right number of beds on the right level of care so that when people need them, they can get into them? It's not just about hospital beds but it's about access to community. What is the criteria for evaluating the state's comprehensive and effectively working? What might a reasonable modification be, or when would it become a fundamental oper alteration? Do they have to seek additional appropriations? What costs could be considered, and how do you compare costs for the various types of services? But the plan requires you to say, now, how do we get from where we are and how do we move forward towards that goal? We've often heard Minnesota is so far ahead of the game, we don't need a plan. We won't be deemed out of compliance. And we were far ahead of the curve on many things. We had home and community-based services. We had menus of choices. But when you dissect that against Olmstead, again, if I live in rural Minnesota, and the service I need to support me to stay in my home rather than going into the nursing home or other form of institution. The other reason um, why Minnesota has to do this is because we've done a lot, but now we still have people backed up in institutions. There are more than 29 states that have Olmstead plans. That's the number that kind of shows up on one of those websites, but there were states who developed it before that website was even developed, so there are more states. Um, we're under pressure from the federal court um, in the Jensen Settlement Agreement, which came out of um, conditions at Minnesota Extended Treatment Options. In Minnesota, it came out of the Jensen lawsuit, which certainly was about uh, the conditions in a particular facility and about somehow making those individuals whole. But the plaintiffs wanted much more than that. They wanted all people with disabilities. They wanted to not have these things happen to people with disabilities again. 
And so one of the requirements of the settlement agreement was that the state um, would develop an Olmstead plan that was working, effective, and measurable. The principles of the Jensen settlement case were Olmstead, most integrated setting, person-centered planning, use of positive behavioral supports, and opportunities for the individual and for families to provide input and feedback about the facility. Too often, uh, you turn your loved one over to a professional, and they say, well, we know what we're doing, you know. But the family is the most knowledgeable person on the day-to-day -day life of the person, except for the person themselves. And to the extent they might not be able to communicate it, the family's the next best choice. The governor's order gave specific direction, support, freedom of choice, and opportunity for people with developmental disabilities, and the governor felt strongly enough that he appointed the lieutenant governor to be the chair of this group. Um, there are several cabinet level agencies, and then myself and Colleen Wick from the Governor's Council on Developmental Disabilities are on as ex officio members because of our background, knowledge, and experience with both the Jensen Settlement Agreement and the rights of individuals with disabilities. The plan must be developed and um, submitted to the court by November 1st. The state shall develop and implement, so it can't be a plan that sits on a shelf. Um, it has to use measurable goals. Um, after the plan is committed, it will go to the court monitor in the Jensen Settlement Agreement, the federal judge, to determine if the state of Minnesota is in substantial compliance with the Jensen Settlement Agreement. When the plan is done, are we done? Absolutely not. This is a growing, living, and breathing plan. This is a quote from one of the plaintiffs in Olmstead vers um, versus Elsie. And this is her quote after she moved out. Now this is someone they felt could not live in the community without heavy duty supports which could only be provided in an institution. Hopefully you take something away from what you learned the whole day. Thank you. <laughs>